Good evening, everyone. My name is, uh, well, thank you. My name is Paula Demers, and on behalf of the Walker Lecture Series Board, I'd like to welcome you to the historic Concord City Auditorium for the Walker Lecture Series spring season. Uh, just a couple things before uh, I introduce our guest. We are in the process of evaluating how we advertise, how we get our information out to all of you. And I just was wondering if you could help me out. Oh, that'll help. Um, if you could just raise a hand if you have heard about our season or any, you know, our, our programs or anything through the following media. So you could just raise your hand if, if you've seen it. If you haven't, that's okay too. That's important feedback for us to get. Um, has anyone heard about our programs on the radio? Okay, good information, thank you. How about Facebook? Okay, we've got a couple, excellent, all right. How about in, um, Maybe we haven't had much theater going on, but if you've seen our advertisements in programs when you've gone to the theater, just a few. Okay, great. Last one, how about our email list, if you get our emails? Oh, good, oh, look at that. So if you do not get our emails, you can go to our website, which our webpage, which I think is walkerlecture.org. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And you can sign up to be on our emailing list and we won't bombard you with emails. You will only get emails when we have a program coming up to uh, let you know that that's happening. So that would probably be a great way for you to find out. All right, well, <clears throat> now, very excited. No, well, so here's the thing. At other evenings we've asked, we've gotten a big response about newspapers, so we know that that is a great place to advertise. It was these three or four that we just wanted to touch base on. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Thank you for letting me know, though. Yes, Concord Monitor is our friend. All right, um, let's see, so this evening, we are very pleased to have with us Patrick Anderson. Patrick was supposed to be here two years ago, but something happened, so he couldn't come, but finally he's here. So um, we uh, are so happy to have him here finally. He is a film buff and a scholar. He is a professor emeritus at Colby Sawyer College, and he lives in South Sutton, New Hampshire. He's also a Gibney Distinguished Professor, and he's taught American Studies, Film, and Native American Studies. Tonight, we are very excited because he is going to be sharing with us uh, the talent of three silent film masters, Sennett, Chaplin, and Keaton, for the first part of our of our evening will be the, um, the art of silent film comedy. And then the second half will be a little bit more about films and the history of film. So hold on to your seats. We're gonna go back in time a little bit. Thank you all for coming and please welcome Patrick Anderson. Thank you. And we can move to the slides. Um, Keaton, um, as you'll see, loved machines, loved huge objects, loved huge crowds. Um, and in everything he did, he remained sort of still. He, he never cracked a smile. He was called the great stone face. Um, we see how acrobatic he is, I think, in the sequence where he is tumbling down that hill with the rocks following him. Um, and of course, he always knew about timing. After he successfully you know, avoids all the big rocks, it's the little one that finally does him in. 
And finally, we'll come to Chaplin. Um, actually, we're, I'm, I'm looking at, at Keaton last in my remarks, but, but, but Chaplin is introduced to us here too because he took comedy to a whole new level. Um, going from the slapstick of Max Sennett, which he learned because he worked at the Max Sennett studio for a while, um, but then he created this universal character. Um, Charlie Chaplin dolls were one of the most popular items for children to buy in the 1920s. If McDonald's had Happy Meals back then, you'd find a Charlie Chaplin doll in it, I, I bet. Um, so he, he, um, he was a master of this craft. Um, he took his art very seriously. There were um, reels of his, what, um, rejected shots, uh, rejected sequences found um, outside Paris a number of years ago. And it was revealed that in one scene, he shot it 120 times because he was such a perfectionist. Um, so anyway, th th these, are, these are all masters of silent comedy who interpret this whole medium in a lot of different ways. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, so we'll just look very briefly. This is the slide I began with um, because when we think of Senate, we think of Keystone Cops. When we think of Chaplin, we think of the way he sort of transcended, um, he, he made his objects transcend into other things. Here, his boot, because he's starving in this cabin in one of the greatest comedies ever made, the 1925 um, Gold Rush. Um, he boils his boot and has that for Thanksgiving dinner. And here we have Keaton sort of looking out at a world he can never quite understand or master, but he makes his way through it as best he can. And you've already seen um, this image, um, the film it came from, Safety Last, appropriately named, um, with Harold Lloyd. So um, we're going to be looking at each of these three different masters of, of, of comedy in a number of different ways. The first comedy can be attributed to these documentary filmmakers in France, the Lumiere brothers, who had a photograph, um, st photography studio just outside Paris. And one day, um, this gardener is watering, the, the, the film is called Watering the Gardener, it lasts 30 seconds, and this kid comes up and steps on the hose. The gardener looks at the hose and wonders what's going on. The kid steps off the hose, the water goes in his face. That's the first recorded bit of slapstick humor on film, and it also presaged what Max Sennett would do so brilliantly, and that is to use water in very humorous ways. Um, Edison, this country, would film, this guy was one of his mechanics, his name was Fred Ott. He had a very hilarious sneeze, apparently. And so this was on one of those hand-cranked devices where you could see Fred Ott sneeze and laugh at the poor guy. Georges Méliès, you may have heard of him before, made a wonderful film called A Trip to the Moon. Um, Hugo was a film that um, Martin Scorsese made a number of years ago, which was in tribute to this guy. Anyway, he filmed some imaginative um, pieces like A Trip to the Moon, the first science fiction film. He used special effects, but the camera never did much work. He did everything post-production by editing, but he was doing comic scenes too. In this country, D.W. Griffith, the controversial early filmmaker, of course, when you make a film like Birth of a Nation, which um, celebrates the Klan coming to the rescue, you have to look askance at him. But he was a masterful artist of, of cinema because he did things no one had done before. And he made one of the earliest um, comic films with Max Sennett. Max Sennett was an actor before he became um, a producer. And that's him on the left. It's called The Curtain Pole. Um, and it came out in 1908, um, a number of years before Sennett started making his own movies. But Max Sennett really wanted to make films with cops, and so that's what he did. Sennett's career spanned about 30 years of work with half a dozen studios, but it's his years at Keystone in the mid-19-teens um, that were his most exciting and important when he made the films which best reflect his comic technique. And the technique was based on several factors which we have come to define as slapstick. There is breathless, nonstop motion. Many of his movies, in fact, are nothing more than chase scenes from start to finish. There's smashing and crashing physical humor, collisions, explosions, pratfalls, bricks, bullets, buckets of water, custard pies. And if you were wondering, the custard pies were made from blueberries because they filmed best. They tried all sorts of kinds of pies and they found that blueberries showed best on film. It was also the messiest to get out of the costumes. Third, he did a lot of zany non sequiturs, like this missile ride here. He didn't care if his, um, if his films had a plot. 
or if his plots made sense or not, because usually he didn't even have a plot. And finally, he created this incredible stable of typecast clowns, including Fatty Arbuckle and Mabel Normand, who you see right here in this um, still. You may have heard of a Broadway show a number of years ago called Mac and Mabel. Um, this is about Mac Sennett and Mabel Normand, his on-again, off-again girlfriend. So underlying um, Sennett's humor, though he was certainly unaware of it, was French philosopher Henri Bergson's theory of comedy, um, which is the conversion of men into machinery. As I said before, we can laugh at the brutality of the slapstick in these movies, according to Bergson, because Senate never lets us get close enough to his bathing beauties or his cops to feel sympathy or any other emotion for them, because they don't seem to be feeling anything themselves. They are rather mechanized assembly line clowns distinguished through makeup, costume, and physical size only as certain types. And this was the problem that Chaplin had when he went to work with Senate. Senate saw him as another Keystone cop and dressed him as a Keystone cop in this particular film, as you can see right here. But Chaplin saw himself as a character. As Senate told Chaplin the first day his newest clown um, was at the Keystone studio, we have no scenario here. We get an idea, then follow the natural sequence of events till it leads to a chase, which is the essence of our comedy. Senna's chases were the centerpieces of each of his movies. Um, and these movies can be sort of classified into three different groups. One is a conventional formulaic melodrama like this one. It's called Tilly's Punctured Romance from 1914. Um, and it's basically making hash of, of the more serious melodramas that people like Griffith were making. Um, it's all dependent on physical types. We have the, the large Marie Dressler here, starring against the diminutive Chaplin. Another typical Senate film is the parody picture in which the entire film makes fun of the style, theme, and storyline of other contemporary popular successes. His most famous parody is this one, 1916, Teddy at the Throttle, with Gloria Swanson and Wallace Beery. It's a hilarious lampoon of Griffith's last minute rescue scenes, because in this case, the rescue is made by the dog. Teddy. The third and perhaps most characteristic of his comedies were his spontaneous improvisations in which he employed a technique known as riffing, which is taking a place or situation or event and thinking of all the gags that might take place here and throwing them at the audience. And if this one doesn't work in 30 seconds, maybe the next one will, and usually one of them did. One of these riffing pictures was called Kid Auto Races at Venice from 1914, and it was made because Senate, upon learning that some actual auto races involving children were taking place at Venice Beach, California, sent a cast and crew to the scene to improvise. What was their impro improvisation? Well, that a camera crew was on hand to shoot documentary footage of the race, only to be interrupted by an onlooker, played by Chaplin in his tramp costume for the first time, who kept botching their shooting by walking into the frame and standing in front of the camera apparently unaware of what filmmaking was all about. This self-reflexive matter um, material in this, in this movie about movie making is found again and again throughout Senate's career as titles like Mabel's tr Dramatic Career in which Senate himself on the right of the still um, starred, a movie star, movie fans, and the Hollywood kid all suggest. In selecting movie making as a subject for many of his movies, Senate was undoubtedly improvising with something he had most immediately at hand but he was also showing his viewers the inner workings of his studio, exposing his cinematic secrets by revealing the artifice on which his comedies were based. The trickery of his camera technique did much the same thing. As I mentioned before, he intentionally undercranked the camera, and then he removed every third or fourth frame during the editing, so he created people and things that could never in real life behave the way they do over and over again in his films. His comedies then, took the viewers for a wild ride through his often surrealistic landscapes and left them breathlessly delighted at Journey's End. There was nothing more here than meets the eye, as Senate himself acknowledged. Once we stopped to let anybody analyze us, he said, we're sunk. But what met the eye for Senate and his viewers was quite enough. He'd leave it to Chaplin and Keaton to make comedy more complex. Senate not only established the foundations for silent comedy that followed, he got many of the best screen comics started at his fun factory in Edendale, California. The most famous of these, of course, was Charlie Chaplin, who had signed with the Senate Studios for $150 a week in 1913. That'd be a lot of dough today. 
when he was touring the U.S. with Fred Carnot's pantomime troupe, and he proceeded to make 35 comedies, two-thirds of which he wrote and directed himself during the single year he spent at Keystone. Think about that. He made 35 films the first year he was there. These are short films, of course. Um, they're ripped off, you know, in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, probably, um, sometimes less than that. But he was learning his apprenticeship. He was learning how to make movies at Senate. And while he disagreed with Senate's basic comic methods from the start, he did learn a great deal about the craft of motion pictures from Senate, much as Senate had learned it from Griffith. He learned, first of all, the importance of timing, pacing, and film editing. He discovered how to use the camera to confide directly in the audience by establishing an intimacy between performer and viewer that previously did not exist. He broke the fourth wall. He would often look at us. He wanted to confide in us. He wanted our sympathy. He wanted our love. He grew up as an orphan in London. Um, he was sent to an orphanage for the poor. And he was always, I think, looking for the approval of other people. I mean, we could do a whole Freudian thing on him, but it, it clearly seems to be um, part of his MO when you, you start thinking of, of the movies he made. He also was well aware from the start that the best comedy is comedy played straight. If what you're doing is funny, Ch um, Chaplin theorized as he's battling a Murphy bed here in a movie called 1 AM, you don't have to be funny doing it. And finally at Keystone, that is Senate studio, he came to appreciate the comic effectiveness of purely physical humor, though he knew that he would never be satisfied with that alone. So the first day he spent at this studio, at Keystone, Senate explained the main state of his comedy was the chase while Chaplin appreciated what he called the alfresco spirit that infused the Senate method, feeling it offered a challenge to his honest spot creativity, he had no use for Senate's beloved chase. It dissipated one's personality, he said in his autobiography, and as little as I knew about movies, I knew that nothing transcended personality. He was a stage star. He knew the reaction he got from the people in the audience, and that's the same reaction he wanted from the crowd in the movie theater, even though he wasn't there in person. So what he did as early as his second film with Senate was to begin to create that personality. In the first film, as Walter Matthau pointed out, called Making a Living, he reprised one of his favorite British roles, that of his English dandy. But this was short-lived because in that film I've already mentioned, Kid Auto Races at, at Venice, he came up with the, the, the costume and the character of the tramp that was his signature for the next 20-some years. He borrowed a pair of Fatty Arkell's baggy pants, a pair of Ford Sterling's immense shoes, a tight-fitting jacket, and a derby one size too small. The clothes assembled, he pasted on a toothbrush mustache, and then completed the costume with a cane, like that used by French comic Max Linder at the same time period. He used it, the image tramp used it for everything from hoisting women's skirts to playing billiards to navigating his way up the snowy mountains of Alaska in the gold. Chaplin claimed he had no idea of the tramp's character as he was assembling the costume, but the moment I was dressed, he says, the clothes and the makeup made me feel the person I was. I began to know him and gags and comic ideas went racing through my mind. His first gags were pure Senate slapstick. He played against huge men like Max Swain and Eric Campbell to emphasize the contrast in size and found himself in situations completely dependent on physical humor. His brain was seldom active then, Chaplin says about the tramp. Only his instincts, which were, con was, were concerned with the basics, food, warmth, and shelter. Despite the rather primitive nature of the tramp's character during these early shorts, Chaplin made it clear from the start that his way of being funny was diametrically opposed to that practiced by his boss and everyone else at Keystone. For Senate, you'll remember, envisioned comedy as an endless series of superficial, disconnected gags that were developed at an incredibly dizzy pace by an impersonal core of unindividuated machine-like clowns. His goal was quite simply to provoke laughter without pr probing any of the meanings or implications behind the obvious. Chapman, on the other hand, saw comedy as a way to make a serious social and philosophical statement, and so he refined his tramp character into a moral individual and made use of the extended comic sequence rather than the laugh a second gag, which allowed him to develop both his character and the point he was trying to put across. But the thing that made the Tramp character so extremely appealing finally 
was the cinematic method Chaplin used to establish an intimate relationship between his character and his audience. For in playing the tramp, Chaplin is also playing to the audience in a way that Senate's dizzy mechanical clowns could not and Keaton's stone-faced persona would not. He does this quite simply by inviting us inside the frame with him and letting us share in the hilarity, the pathos, the sentiment through those knowing glances he directs our way. He creates this intimacy with the viewer by reducing film form to its simplest and most efficient level. The function, the function for, for Chaplin above all was to serve the performer, not intrude upon a scene for its own bravura. Thus, while some critics have concluded that Chaplin had no cinematic style, his style, I believe, was to achieve precisely such a perception. That is, he manipulated the language of film so successfully through unobtrusive middle distance composition and invisible editing that all consciousness of its manipulation completely disappears and the viewer is able to focus with no distractions on the film's most important element, the performance of the tramp, the performance of Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin was indeed a cinematic genius. He wrote his movies, he directed his films, he started them, he composed the music even for the silent films which would be played on set to put the actors in the mood. And then when sound comes around and eventually, you know, these films are released as films with, with, with music, those soundtracks played there too. He did everything I'd like to tell my students but play the female lead and in one film he did that. One of the most powerful of these elements in film was the music which played such an integral part in his production that he composed, as I said, the scores for most of his films himself. The music he wrote for City Lights, for example, in modern times, both of those films came out after, after silent films were dead. And everyone said, Chaplin, you can't make a sound movie. No one's making sound movies now. And he said, watch me. They were both brilliant. City Lights in 1931 is his masterpiece. 36. Um, gave us modern times, a sort of anti-technology film. Anyway, in, in these films, his, his, um, his producers and, and others around him would say, well, well, let's make the music funny. And he said, I don't want the music to be funny. I don't want any distractions to take away from what I'm doing as a comic. And so he wanted the music to be a counterpoint, a counterpoint that was um, sort of elegant and sometimes sentimental, romantic. They wanted the music to be funny, he said, but I would explain that I wanted no competition. I wanted the music to be, to be a counterpoint of grace and charm to express sentiment. The music also underscores the serious, sometimes tragic implications of what lies behind the ostensible hilarity of his films, resulting in a tension, a depth, and a sensibility and a complexity that was uniquely Chaplin's. And this, I think, as I've alluded to before, comes from his childhood. He survived a childhood in London that Charles Dickens might have written about. Both his parents were musical performers, so that was sort of Chaplin's entree into the world of the theater, but his father turned out to be alcoholic and died, and his mother suffered from ill health and went insane, all before Chaplin was 10. As a result, he spent two years in an orphanage for the poor. Can you pick him out? He's in the very center, that cute kid with the little dark hair. Um, three up from the bottom. Yeah, okay, so, so if, you, if you go to the middle, and there's one kid, then the second kid above him, and there's the third kid above that. So one, two, three. You can kind of see him, you can kind of see his face in there, actually. So, both he and his brother Sidney, who was also a vaudeville performer, um, they were put in this, this orphanage for the poor, and it was here that he realized that life wasn't very great, you know, when, when you're sort of a tramp, but when you're on the outside of society. He also recounts a story um, when he was back home living with his mom um, that he thinks was the reason why his, his films balance on that shortage between comedy and tragedy. And I want to just read you this passage from his autobiography. At the end of our street was a slaughterhouse. Sheep would pass our house on their way to be butchered. I remember one escaped and ran down the street to the amusement of onlookers. Some tried to grab it and others tripped over themselves. 
I had giggled with delight at its lambent capering and panic, it seemed so comic. But when it was caught and carried back into the slaughterhouse, the reality of the tragedy came over me and I ran indoors, screaming and weeping to my mother, they're going to kill it, they're going to kill the lamb. That stark spring afternoon and that comic chase stayed with me for days. And I wonder if that episode did not establish the premise of my future films, the combination of the tragic and the comic. Well, the combination of the tragic and the comic is reflected most obviously in his feature films, as I mentioned, things like City Lights and Modern Times. But the possibilities of his character, its tensions and ambiguities were present the first time he assembled the trap costume because the costume itself is simply a study in contradictions. And here's a clip from Modern Times. The diminutive derby versus the huge shoes, the skin-tight jacket versus the billowing pants, the gentleman's outfit, though admittedly on the shabby side, versus the tramp's actual status in life. It's a contradiction which is most poignantly realized in his 1931 masterpiece, City Lights. His central role, as in all of his movies, is a tramp. He's penniless, but once he befriends a millionaire who is going to kill himself by throwing himself into the river here, and he's drunk, Chaplin saves him, the millionaire embraces Chaplin, you're my long lost friend, you can have anything you want. And so he's treated to sort of the, the, the life of wealth for a little bit. So that's one side of Chaplin, that, that, that side, you know, of the, 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 the tuxedo before it was shabby. The other side is represented by the other main character in the film, the flower seller. She happens to be blind, so she can't see who Chaplin really is. And he pretends to her that he's someone who he's not. Because, of course, when the millionaire's drunk, he gives him his rolls, he gives him his bankroll, he gives him fancy clothes, and he allows him to court this woman in style. One of my favorite scenes in the film is this scene. Chaplin's out for a spin in the millionaire's um, Rolls Royce. When he sees this other gentleman about to get rid of a, of a cigar, you know, the old stogie, he throws it down the street. Chaplin zooms the rolls down, jumps out of the car, grabs the stogie, and puts it in his mouth, much of the bewilderment of a real tramp who is looking on saying, what are you doing, sir? He might look like a gentleman, but at heart, he's a tramp. And this is sort of the fundamental, you know, irony of, of Chaplin's character, you know, caught between these two different personas. This is the final um, shot of, of City Lights, and, and City Lights ends in this incredibly poignant way, and, and it's brilliant for 1931 because it doesn't give us a definite answer, doesn't give us a definitive uh, conclusion. He has, through the millionaire, gotten enough money to send um, the flower girl to Europe. They're always sending them to Europe back in the 30s for miracle cures. Okay, so she's clear, cured of her blindness. And in the meantime, he's been accused of stealing the money from the millionaire, so he spent some time in jail, and so at the end, he's at his shabbiest ever. She, on the other hand, is, has opened a fancy new flower shop. And there are some boys with pea shooters kind of picking on him in the streets, making fun of him and she sees him from her flower shop. Of course, she doesn't know who he is. A handsome guy with a big, tall top hat had come in earlier, and she thinks that must be her suitor because she's never seen him before. So then she goes out and gives him a flower and feels his hand. Their only communication before was through the hands, and she recognizes it, whose it is. And he says, you can see now, and she nods, and this is the final shot. She can see now, Will she now see through her heart or through her more materialistic eyes since she is now much more successful? We don't know, and that's part of the beauty of this film. I want to end this, this bit on Chaplin, and then we can take a break and come back for Keaton. Um, just with a quote from one of the great books on silent film comedies by Walter Kerr. It's called The Silent Clowns, and he talks about the fact that because Chaplin takes on so many different identities, maybe he has no real identity at all, or maybe it's a, an identity that the audience can project on him. The moment he wishes to become a boxer, writes Kerr, he becomes an extraordinarily deft one. The moment he wishes to put on roller skates, he becomes Dijinsky on wheels. If he wishes to gamble, he's at once a shark. 
If he's inducted as a soldier, he can capture the Kaiser. He can farm, play a violin, cope with bullies, duel as Fairbanks duel. He can be a woman, I promised you this, he's on the right. He can be a woman seductively. The secret of Charlie Chaplin as a character, says Kerr, is that he can be anyone. The secret is a devastating one. For the man who can, with a flick of a finger, the blink of an eyelash, instantly transform himself into absolutely anyone is a man who must in his heart remain no one. This then is the fundamental irony at the heart of this complicated character. This is what leads to the pathos and sentiment of those later features where he waddles down the road in the final frame. This is the tragic implication for one like Chaplin who could not comfortably be either an insider or an outsider. This is finally what makes his character and his comedy as universally rich, satisfying, and enduring as they are. Okay, so I, I'm sure I'm beyond um, what we're supposed to be returning from your break right now. So if you'd like a little break, we can take it, and then we can come back and conclude with Buster Keaton. <laughs> Keaton, next to Chaplin, made the greatest impact on silent comedy. And just as I told you a bit about Chaplin's childhood as kind of a springboard for his comedy, I want to tell you a bit about Keaton's. He was born Joseph Francis Keaton in 1895 and earned the nickname Buster at the age of um, six months, actually, um, when his uh, godfather, Harry Houdini, you've heard of him, um, he was traveling on the vaudeville circuit with Keaton's parents and saw little Buster, saw little um, Joseph, I should say, fall down a flight of stairs at a theatrical boarding house. Get up and start laughing. Houdini gasped, grabbed the child, his godchild, turned to his parents and said, that's some buster your kid just took. Well, the name stuck. And the kid continued to take one buster after another as he grew up with the most fantastic one occurring three months before his third birthday in Kansas. Um, I have a grandson who is um, two and a half or so, so I can just imagine little Bennett doing this. The day got off to an inauspicious start when Buster lost part of a finger in a clothes wringer and then injured his head with a rock he'd thrown up in the air attempting to dislodge a peach from a tree. But these were mere warm-ups for what happened to him in the afternoon. While his parents were at the theater giving a matinee performance, they locked little Buster in an upstairs room, but they opened the window so he'd have some air. Well, while they're in the theater, a, a cyclone or a hurricane comes through town. He goes to the window, and this literally happened. I've seen the news reports in my research. It sucked Buster out of the window, carried him several blocks through the air, and deposited him unscratched in the middle of a street where he was surrounded by debris from the storm. Some Buster. Unintended stunts like these foreshadowed one of the principal components of Earth's performance on both stage and screen, namely the incredible use of his body. He earned the title the human mop as a member of his parents' vaudeville act, as he was literally tossed about the stage. No, I don't like the blackface here either, but that was what was happening. He was thrown th through the scenery, bounced off the bass drum, and my favorite, swung into the wings by means of a suitcase handle that was sewn on the back of one of his costumes. The result of all this vaudeville violence was that he had to learn to be acrobatic and take falls properly simply to survive the act. It was a lesson he learned well, for he was still taking falls as he neared the age of 70, explaining his successful technique in particular modern terms. When you take a fall, he advised, simply use your head as a joystick. Vaudeville also instructed Keaton in the art of improvisation. He loved the freedom he had to make his act new and different every night, a freedom he enjoyed as well when he first began working with Fatty Arbuckle in the movies. Fatty Arbuckle, of course, was one of those stars that uh, Mr. Sennett had cultivated. He went on to produce his own movies. He got into some problems. As you may know, he had a scandal in the 1920s. Um, had to stop making films, had to change his name. When he came back to the movies, his nickname was Will Be Good. Anyway, just a little footnote on Fatty. There was no script in those days, Keaton wrote. We simply talked over what we were going to do, got our ideas, and went to work. Finally, Vaudeville gave Keaton an enormous appreciation for the beauty and mechanics of pantomime and silent jokes, forms with Keaton came to master in film. 
Another boyhood trait Keaton carried over into the movies was his unabashed love for inventions, gadgets, and mechanical devices. Indeed, he often said that had he not started making films, he'd have been an engineer, an inclination many of his films reflect. In a short from 1922 called The Electric House, the humor stems from the fact that Keaton's character is mistakenly presented with an engineer's diploma. He was probably a liberal arts major like me and is immediately hired to mechanize a house. The results are hilarious as everything he does from electrifying the stairs to improving the plumbing goes quite literally haywire. You turn on the, um, you turn on the sink and the toilet flushes. The mechanical mind that is reflected in films like The Electric House might have been what caused the not yet three-year-old Keaton to explore the clothes wringer in Kansas. It is certainly what led to the zany inventions he came, with at his, came up with at his parents' summer home um, at Lake Muskegon, Michigan. Things like the outhouse on the top of the bluff, whose walls collapsed when the victim got comfortably seated. Gadgets like his waking up gizmo and his trick fishing pole and vehicles like his kitty car, which you see here, and his giant bike. This affection for and use of the mechanical became an integral part of his films, both in front of and behind the camera. From the start, Keaton was fascinated by the technical aspects of movie making. One of the first things I did, he remembers, was tear a motion picture camera practically to pieces and find out about the lenses and the splicing of film and how to get it all in the projector. Thus, Keaton was drawn to the mechanics of the movies from the start, to the very form of film itself. Unlike Chaplin, and, and this is a real difference between these two comics, unlike Chaplin, who makes the formal aspects of film disappear, as I mentioned to you, he doesn't want us to see any camera work. Chaplin leaps through the lens to be on the same plane as we are by confiding in us, by making us part of his world. Keaton uses those same cinematic elements the lens, the frame, the flat screen, to call attention to the film's form and to use it as a barrier to remain separate from us, expressionless in the world of film. He also had perhaps the most beautiful face of any silent actor. The best example of the separation between film world and real world occurs in a film from 1924 called Sherlock Jr., which if you ever have a chance to see it, please do. It's his most explicit investigation of the properties of film. In one of his most famous sequences, Keaton plays a movie projectionist who, as you can see in this still with double exposure, falls asleep and starts to project himself into the, 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 the movie that he's showing in the theater. And his girlfriend magically becomes um, the heroine on screen too when after several attempts to, he manages to break through the screen's barrier, he enters into the frame of the film. The scene he's a part of changes repeatedly on him, from a quiet garden to a city street to a desert to an island to a snowdrift and then back to the original garden. Nothing, in short, is as it seems here. The real, that is, non-film buster, that guy back running the projector, is tricked, fooled, and deceived time and again by the illusionary possibilities of film. The two worlds are simply not the same. What Keaton is announcing here through this very clever film within a film sequence in Sherlock Jr. is that film is film and should not be mistaken for life. It operates by its own laws within the frame and can't be reconciled with the properties of life outside the frame. Having said this, I must also say that, above everything else, Keaton respected the integrity of the camera and its ability to record realism. So he refused, except on the rarest occasion, like some of those I just showed you, to use any Senate-esque trick photography or Melies-like illusions. He preferred to use long takes and long shots so the viewer could see how everything was being done and also appreciate the acrobatic talents of his entire body working together in physical space. And this is a wonderful scene because we see him turning around the corner and when he gets about halfway down the street, the entire New York police force will be after him. The long takes also allowed him to reveal the fact that he was doing all the stunts himself. For one scene in Sherlock Jr., he even removes one wall of a room 
so we can see the stunt develop from start to finish, and it's an incredible stunt. Before entering this cabin, he places a hoop. You can see the hoop there in the right-hand window. He places the hoop in an open window, and then when he's threatened by things happening inside, he begins to jump through the hoop, which happens to conceal a woman's dress. As he lands outside, he still hasn't made a cut in the sequence. He has magically been transformed into a woman and makes his escape. Where'd that guy go, they say. Another stunt from the same film didn't go quite as planned. For in jumping off this train, he grabbed a water spout, which was supposed to be empty, but wasn't. And he's doused with an incredible force of water. Momentarily stunned, he nonetheless jumps up, kind of scratches his neck. Remember that six-month-old buster back in Kansas? Ran off in pursuit of the man he was tracking. Keaton was in such perfect physical condition at the time that he didn't know until he had a physical two years later and his doctor told him, gee, it seems like you broke your collarbone. Keaton's stunting with the locomotive in Sherlock Jr. is typical of another element basic to his comedy, and that relates to his mechanical bent discussed earlier, especially his relationship with huge objects and overwhelming forces. The use of objects had been a mainstay in film comedy ever since that gardener was sprayed by his own hose in that 1895 clip I showed you. Senna's objects, his tin lizzies and custard pies and bombs, served much the same function as his mechanical clowns. They were comic weapons to be used up and discarded, to destroy or be destroyed. While the objects Chaplin confronts might also end up demolished, he exhausts their comic possibilities before the final blow, as is the case with the alarm clock in a celebrated sequence from a film called The Pawn Shop. Chaplin examines the clock first as if it were a medical patient, testing its ticker with a stethoscope then as a can of food, removing its lid with an auger. Once opened, he checks out the insides with a jeweler's um, eyepiece and removes the faulty part with pliers. When this causes his inner workings to uncoil, he stretches them out and cuts them off like yard cuts. After totally dismantling the poor timepiece, he's in a pawn shop after all. This guy has brought it in to, to get some money. Chaplin shakes his head firmly puts the dismembered parts together in the customer's hat and turns away, simply can't accept it. For Chaplin then, an object is never merely what it appears to be, but through what critic James Agee called Chaplin's inflection. It can take on a series of identities, each dependent on the comedian's attitude toward it at any given moment and his ability to transform them. For Keaton, on the other hand, objects seem not so much to be transformed as with Chaplin, nor destroyed as with Senate, but simply to be accepted for what they were and managed in the most efficient way possible so he could go about his business. The essential requirement for everything Keaton confronted in his films was enormous size, so the contrast between the tiny deadpan comic and the seemingly overwhelming obstacle would be all the more pronounced. A contrast both Senate and Chaplin employed too, though not to the degree uh, Keaton used it. Because Keaton pitted himself against unwieldy opponents like ocean liners, steamboats, locomotives, some of you have seen the brilliant film The General, dinosaurs and miswired houses. And if gargantuan objects weren't enough, there were uncontrollable crowds, herds of cattle, tribes of Indians, the entire New York police force I was referring to before, both Union and Confederate armies, a church full of would-be brides, and the unstoppable forces of nature too. Storms at sea, waterfalls, landslides, and one he knew especially well from first-hand experience, cyclones. Although the size of the object and the force would seem to make effective action against the nearly impossible, Keaton remains throughout his confrontations unperturbed and expressionless as he simply attempts to adapt to whatever situation, object, or force fate throws his way. One way he adapts is by merging with the object he has confronted and becoming one with it, a strategy he uses several times in his brilliant short called The Balloonatic from 1923. This is a really masterful film. In an early scene, he accidentally takes off in a hot air balloon, or rather on top of it. Don't ask how he gets there. After carefully crawling down the netting, he slips from the ropes into the basket and then through the basket 
grabbing its rim at the last moment to save himself. The image that results is surrealistic. It's a balloon man with Keaton's legs sticking out of the torso-like basket and the balloon itself serving as its head. In a later scene, he's canoeing on a stream when the water gets shallow and he decides to go to shore. Instead of paddling the rest of the way, it's really too shallow to paddle anymore. Anyway, he stands up. His legs, it turns out, have been in the water the whole time through holes in the bottom of the boat. And he simply walks to shore. The, bir the bird-like balloon man has become the amphibious canoe man. And in the film's final image, which I'm sorry I, I, I couldn't find to, to reproduce for you, but I'll like, describe it. The balloon and the canoe themselves become one. Yes, the balloon returns at the end of this movie. Keaton and his girlfriend are in the canoe. Unbeknownst to them, they are floating ominously toward a sheer waterfall. They embrace as the canoe nears the brink and kiss as it glides straight into space, riding now so it seems on thin air or their bliss. But the camera pulls back to show that the balloon from the start of the movie has hooked onto the canoe's canopy by its land anchor, leaving the happy couple navigating through the sky in a canoe. Throughout all of this remarkably magical scene, Keaton never once changes his expression, not even when he kisses his girlfriend. He's simply making the best of whatever object he confronts, whatever situation he finds himself in much as he did when his car plunged into a lake at the end of Sherlock Jr. and floated away. Confrontations with objects like these are the source of Keaton's narratives, of his humor, and ultimately of his pathos. His unruffled attitude toward a threatening world that aims to crush him, and his remarkable adaptability to that world, have been seen by many critics as being fundamentally characteristic of modern existentialist man. The final chase scene in a, another lovely film called Daydreams illustrates this perfectly. Being pursued by the police, Keaton tries hiding in the paddle wheel of a ferry boat. You know what's gonna happen. Suddenly it starts up. Faster and faster and faster it turns and what can Keaton do but run along with it? Faster and faster and faster. Trying to keep his head above water, refusing to give up. Keaton's world moves and he must move with it. Yet even in this frantic moment, movement, he remains, as we see reflected on his face, essentially quiet, impassive, expressionless. This image of the expressionless Keaton in continual motion, an image duplicated in hundreds of scenes throughout his movies, represents the central paradox of his films and relates to the basic contradiction about motion pictures themselves. For what are movies? but really still pictures, each frozen within their individual frames. Given the illusion of movement by passing a light source, of course, this isn't true with DVDs, but this was true when he was making movies, at regular intervals, and being connected as we watch them through the persistence of vision capacity of our eyes. By so closely approximating the form of film itself in his comedy, Keaton emerges as the most silent and the most cinematic of all silent comedians. And so, when this fellow Al Jolson spoke the first words on film in The Jazz Singer in 1927 to break the sound barrier, Keaton's comedy was especially hard hit. Like Chaplin, Keaton depended on the world of silence unfettered by clumsy microphones, faster film speeds, and sound-imposed editing techniques to develop the pantomime and acrobatics that were essential to his comic style. Can you imagine, you know, you've never used a microphone on your set and suddenly these microphones are, are, are coming all over you. If any of you saw um, the terrific musical Singing in the Rain back in the 50s um, with Gene Kelly, um, they do this whole send up of the coming of sound as the, the female lead tries to get wired for sound herself, putting the microphone sort of down her bosom, and then you can hear her heartbeat. I mean, th there were just no easy solutions um, when, when sound came in. And, and Mr. Keaton, as I said, was especially hard hit. <clears throat> Chaplin had the money and the power to resist the tidal wave of sound that swept through Hollywood after the jazz singer, and he went on, as I've mentioned, to make two of his finest films without talk though City Lights and Modern Times did both use sound effects and his own stunning musical scores in extremely effective ways. 
Keaton had neither the money nor the power, nor perhaps the incentive, with his marriage on the skids, his alcoholism on the rise, to hold out as Chaplin did. So he was reduced to starring in low-budget shorts and inferior features, or making cameo appearances in films like Limelight, with Chaplin in the 50s, this is their last great film for both of these individuals, and it's so fitting they made it together, as well as Sunset Boulevard with Gloria Swanson. Um, in fact, Sunset Boulevard, made in 1950, shows through the wasted careers of characters played by Miss Swanson, Eric von Stroheim, and Buster Keaton, some of the irrevocable changes wrought by the sound revolution of the 20s, and in so doing suggests some of the reasons for the decline of silent comedy as, as practiced by Senate Chaplin and Keaton. This study of a former silent movie queen's inability to accept the changes wrought in the film industry by the sound revolution is in many ways a tribute to that earlier period when silent comedy was king. At one point, Gloria Swanson, shown here with her director C Cecil B. DeMille, who was actually her director in the 20s and plays another, <laughs> He plays himself in the 50s in Sunset Boulevard. If you've not seen this film, you, you must. Uh, Miss Swanson hosts a bridge party for the Waxworks, as her gigolo William Holden calls the other forgotten stars, H.B. Warner, Anna Q. Nielsen, and Buster Keaton himself, who drop by her house. In another scene, Swanson does impersonations of both Chaplin and herself as a Max Senate bathing beauty. And in fact, when Chaplin saw the film, he was so taken by um, Gloria Swanson's impersonation, he said, where'd you get that clip of me? But the key scene in this movie, for my purposes, my purpose, occurs after a living room screening of a film called Queen Kelly, which was an actual 1920s Gloria Swanson feature directed by Eric von Stroheim, who in this movie, Sunset Boulevard, plays her butler before, and her first husband. Before the projector is turned off, she steps into its glaring light and delivers the film's central defense of the silent era. Still wonderful, isn't it, she says, and no dialogue. We didn't need dialogue. We had faces, but there aren't such faces like that anymore. Well, those faces of senates, keystone cops, they're dressed, you know, alike, but they have different faces of Keaton's great stone face and of Sir Charles Spencer Chaplin's tramp. Those faces lie at the heart of silent comedy. And after all the pratfalls and the pies, the gags with the cars and trains and water have been forgotten, those faces will remain frozen in time as we've seen tonight, like a single frame of celluloid, archetypal images of that fledgling period of creativity in American film, the silent comedy. Thank you for your patience. And I'm happy to take any questions you have, or I can you know, chat with people afterwards, too. Um, I know it's after nine, so we may forego the, the other part of this, because silent comedy sort of took over, but that's what was what was advertised. Uh, I hope you've learned a bit more about silent comedy than maybe you knew when you entered the auditorium tonight. Um, I, I began all of my film classes at Colby Sawyer uh, with a quote by D.W. Griffith, you know, the controversial director, um, who, who really was the first great sort of artist of the movies, the great, first great poet of the movies, despite some of his politics. He said at one point, because he came to film from theater, he, he was an actor, and he wanted to be a playwright. And he, like many people in the early years of movies, had a disdainful end toward, toward film. Um, film in the first two or three decades of, his, his, of its existence um, used to come at the end of vaudeville shows. So they'd have a live show, then they'd show the movies, and, and movies at that point, some of them were so bad they called them chasers, because they chased the 9 o'clock crowd out of the theater, so the, the 7 o'clock crowd out, so the 9 o'clock would come in. So, so, so anyway, this is the world that Griffith is entering. And when he entered this world, he decided, man, if I'm going to go into these movie, this movie thing, I'm going to do something with it. And so my favorite quote from him 
that I share with my students and that I would share with you is the task I am trying to achieve is above all to make you see. And when my students come to my film classes, you know, they've been born and bred on, on movies, on things visual. I mean, good God, they see things on their phone. I shudder when I'm, I'm in the fitness center and see them watching one of the movies that they're assigned for class on, on you know, their iPhone. I think, this is not right. I, 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 taught my film I taught my film classes in an auditorium like this so I could screen films like they're meant to be screened. But I try to make my students see film in ways that they've never seen it before. And, and my great triumph is, is when students come up to me at the end and say, well, Dr. Anderson, you've ruined film going for me because now when I go to the movies, I think about what I'm looking at. <laughs> and had we had more time tonight, we could have explored, I have a whole program called um, Understanding Movies, the Art of Film, in which I, I show clips from lots of classic movies so we can talk about things like shots and editing and lighting and music and acting, because all of those elements are, are so incredibly important. The Oscars you know, screened a couple of, of weeks ago, uh, unfortunate in many ways. I see Will Smith has been banned from the, um, from the Academy for 10 years, which is pretty appropriate, I think. Um, but we have all those different categories that are being honored. And, and all of those people, all those credits, you know, I stay until the end of the credits. Uh, most people are leaving, but I stay. My poor wife is, you know, wanting to get home. Anyway, um, because I honor these people because they've all had a part. And, and so, um, when we talk about filmmaking, you know, I, I like to break it down to, to appreciate it. And when you talk about silent film, the, the parts are simpler. There are hardly any credits in silent movies, you know? I mean, the, the, you, you, you look at, at credits over the decades and, and they just keep mushrooming and mushrooming because we have many more special effects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but all those folks who are in those credits have lent something to, to motion pictures, okay? Whether they've lit the set, whether they've plugged something in, whether they've helped costume somebody or put on makeup, all of those things are important. And there was a question. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they all um, knew each other. Clearly, um, Senate had the most interaction, um, except for with Keaton. Keaton didn't um, work for Senate, of course, Senate knew, knew him. Um, Senate was good friends with Freddie Arbuckle. Arbuckle good friends with, with Keaton, so, so that whole thing worked. Um, but they were also sort of in competition with one another, which is kind of interesting. You know, I, we, I didn't talk too much about Harold Lloyd, because I, I don't see him developing in the same sort of distinctive way that each of these three figures I've talked about tonight did as far as silent comedy. He did some wonderful things. Um, but Harold Lloyd was very successful economically. His films may have been the most popular of all these, in part because he made so many of them. You know, um, Chaplin's oeuvre is, is more limited because he was such a perfectionist especially when he started making his features beginning with um, the gold rush. I mean, you, you, you get out of the, the gate with the gold rush, you know? I mean, how, how do you top that film? It, it's Woody Allen called it maybe the most perfect comedy ever made. It, it's a film that I use in my film class. I use City Lights in another film class I teach. Um, but but the, these guys did know each other. And as I showed you the clip from Limelight, um, Chaplin sort of honored um, Keaton um, by appearing in the last film that he himself appeared in, um, which I think is a really touching tribute to, to, to Keaton from Chaplin. I think Chaplin recognized um, the brilliance of, of Keaton. Um, Chaplin was much more successful, both financially and artistically, than Keaton was, as I explained. You know, um, Keaton was the most silent of all these guys, and he just could not make that transition. You know, um, Chaplin knew about music. Chaplin, you know, Com composed his scores and um, added sound effects and adapted, even though he would not allow the talk, the tramp to talk. At the very end of the last feature on um, Featuring the Tramp, Modern Times, um, if you haven't seen it, you, you must, it, it's, it's out there. Um, he is hired as a singing waiter at a club, okay? And he doesn't know how to sing or he doesn't know how to remember the words. So his girlfriend, this is where they had those cuffs, you know, that are, that you could put on and off and colors, you know, because you could do the whole shirt anyway. So, so his girlfriend writes the words on his sleeves. So he goes out there, the music is starting, he's all excited, and he goes like this, and he goes like this to start his dance, and the words go flying. 
And so he doesn't know, know what to do. And he keeps dancing around and dancing around, and the orchestra stick keeps playing. And finally, um, he looks to his girlfriend and she says, Just say something. Just say something. And she's mouthing, Just say something. So he makes up this incredible nonsense song. It's as though Chaplin was saying, Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of my voice, but I'm going to give it to you in this nonsense song. I, I, as a tramp, you will never hear me saying anything in English in the language that you would recognize. And it's a fantastic, I mean, this would not have been nearly as funny or effective had it been in English. Um, and, and he just makes up, I mean, he, he pantomimes everything he's saying. And, and, and he's singing these incredible solos. It's, it's, it's really quite, quite stunning. And, and so he could adapt in the way that he could adapt, I think. You know? and, and by this point, you know, Senna's career is pretty much over. I mean, Senna was purely the slapstick king. It is, his great era was probably the, the second decade of the 20th century. Senna's was, and then the others took over from him. Any other questions or comments? I, I know I'm, I'm keeping you over time. You know, my students would say, but I have another class. You know, let's get out of here. Uh, um, it, it's really wonderful. I, I've not, um, for, for two years, I, I retired right after, um, I retired two years ago in, in, in 20. I was, my place is, is in front of, uh, of my students and the second half of that semester, I had to do everything on Zoom, you know, and I, um, I knew my classes by then, so it was fine. And, and they were very interactive, but it's not the same as having a live audience in front of you. So it's it's really wonderful to be talking to a live audience tonight, um, as in, in this wonderful hall here in Concord. Um, and so thank you all for coming out, for patiently sitting here, and for very much.